Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us today on the journey towards self mastery. Our next guest is the first black free driving instructor in South Africa. She's the founder of the Black Mermaid Foundation that aims to diversify the ocean arena while creating a safe space for youth to explore the ocean. She's a TEDx speaker that explored the narrative behind black people and water. She's also part of a three woman team in the discovery show Shark Women. Let's welcome today Ms. Zandi Indlovu, aka the Black Mermaid to the program. Zandi, how you doing today? I am fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. That's probably one of the most beautiful intros I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, well-deserved intro, by the way. You're doing just amazing work for us um, because I feel like a lot of times, and this is not just a South Africa thing, but it's a U.S. thing. I think it's a global thing as well. When we look at uh, ocean spaces, when we look at um, things happening in the ocean, we kind of take ourselves away from that. And I know you've mentioned that people view this as a white people space and it's just all, it's just a global thing. And yeah. there is a history of that in South Africa in regards to how it came to be like that. So I kind of wanted to dive into that a little bit, but before we do, I wanted to just get an understanding of you and the work that you do. Um, so you call yourself the Black Mermaid. So can you explain that name for us? And for those of us that haven't been able to dive into ocean spaces, like what is that like? So I call myself the Black Mermaid because when I started diving, I didn't see anybody that looked like me, not in the real world and not fictionally either. And all of a sudden it felt like, you know, here's this moment. But there's also a song by... Astero, I think that's how you say her name. Mm. And it's uh, it's called Black Mermaid. And when you hear those lyrics, there was such a landing for me. Um, and I think that's probably where we find ourselves, just from a representation space, but the words in her song just being so incredibly validating of the hardships that can be when you are a Black Mermaid, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, what does the world look like? It's the most incredible world that you could ever imagine. Picture endless vast blues and absolutely anything is possible. Anything could show up from in any direction. And, and it's just, it's literally the most incredible world. And what do you find? What do I find in the ocean? It can be big sharks. It can be small sharks. So small sharks like puff adashai sharks, which are quite tiny, actually. And then you get your bigger sharks, which would be your bull sharks. Many people call them Zambezi sharks, but they are also one of the more, they're a bit more daring. If, if we had to speak of like daring sharks, they are mm -hmm. sharks that will ask you, you know, who are you and what are you doing here? They, they're <laughs> that kind. And then you come across your bigger sharks, like your great white sharks, as you spoke about from the Shark Week show. Mm -hmm. And then you find incredible whale life, humpback whales, brides whales, southern right whales. Um, you find beautiful dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, uh, bottlenose dolphins really being the most incredible world. When people say dolphins are playful, you want to come across bottlenose dolphins because they will meet you at the hype that you are at. When you go up, they go up. When you go down, they go down. They're so exciting as an encounter. Just the intelligence is really unparalleled and it's just incredible to witness. Man, it's the a, most beautiful world. <laughs> it sounds amazing, man. I mean, outside of the sharks. We'll, we'll get into the sharks in a, in a little bit. <laughs> it does sound um, just like a wonderful space, man. Um, so, yeah, just getting back into just uh, a little bit about the history of, of everything. You kind of grew up at the tail end of the apartheid in South Africa. And I know you say that there's a huge connection with the apartheid and um, Black people in South Africa having, you know, lack of access to swimming and things like that. So for you, what was it like growing up in that time frame? And um, what was your access to swimming? So, you know, it, it's interesting because you don't know that you're living through a transition, right? Probably, if anything, if there's one thing that I will 
remember to this day, I can still feel the pain of that time. It was when one of the struggle heroes of the time died, Chris Honey. So I don't know if anybody knows him, but he was a key player in the liberation of black people in South Africa. Mm. And I didn't know anything, but the pain that lived in the community when he died, I was young and I can still feel it today, but that's it. And what is the question of access to swimming? So this is the interesting thing. When I was growing up, we had a pool in the community. So I grew up in Soweto in a place called, in Soweto in a place called Pretoria North. Now, Johannesburg is about six hours from the nearest beach. So we're very far from the sea. Mm -hmm. But this pool to get in was 50 cents. And my mother never had that. Like we lived in Soweto until I was probably 15 years old. I can tell you, I can count the number of times I was in that pool on one hand, probably three or four times. Mm. And so 50 cents was the entry fee, but so many of the people didn't have that money. And so it, it was the most pristine place that you could ever imagine because there it was, but it was inaccessible. Mm. And, and I think it always goes back to, you know, when I speak of even in ocean spaces, proximity doesn't equate to access. How do we, how do we bridge the two? And, and that's, that was my story. And in grade six, my mother takes us to my first ever multiracial school. And in this multiracial school is a pool. And we have these PE lessons. And so my first lesson, the teacher says, everybody jump into the pool. Uh, you don't even know how to, you know, <laughs> I didn't know how to swim. And, you know, everybody jumps in and I'm just staring at this water. And this girl says to me, hey, you don't know how to swim, jump on my back. So I jump on her back and she's swimming and in the deep end, she makes a little turn. I fall off her back. And that is my first and only ever drowning experience. I didn't know what to do. Mm. And someone had to jump into the water and take me out. And Miss Berkeley was like trying to, there I am coughing up water because, you know, you don't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how, when I always look at my journey, I've never been a massive swimmer. I taught myself how to swim as I left school and I could afford gym. Wow. And so in the pool gym, in the gym, pool gym, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of figuring it out. And to this day, when you see me swim in the ocean, I, I, can, I can swim, I've become a strong swimmer, but you can tell that I'm not classically trained. <laughs> mm. That is, uh, that's fascinating. So fast forward in that, like, between your experience um the whole free free diving thing is kind of a new thing for you so before that you kind of were doing kind of other work so what was your mindset before getting into the world of the ocean and the water and what made you transition into that space it's so i'm 21 years old and the place where i worked my managing director decides that he's going to start sponsoring mountain biking and somehow I'm running this whole world and I start mountain biking. I learned how to ride a bicycle at 21 years old, as in <laughs> I did not know how to ride a bicycle. And But the, I intro the story by saying that I had begun to explore nature in a way that I'd never been exposed to because mountain bike races happen in mountains and forests in incredible worlds that I had never had access to. And in 2016, I'm 28 years old. I end up in Bali and I end up going on the snorkel excursion that just blows my mind. And I fall in love with the ocean. And yeah, what, that's what is snorkeling for people that, that don't know that don't snorkeling, snorkeling is when you pretty much lay on the surface of the water and you just look at what at the life that lives under there. And normally it is shallow enough for you to be able to see the reef, uh, the fish the and all the life that lives around there normally it doesn't include diving in even though some people might dive in on one breath um and that's how i for me just coming from a world that was so majority brown mm -hmm. you know in soweto you know trees were sparse so the area was mostly brown right and you eventually start working and you're able to afford yourself a little bit of suburbia, which is, you know, a little bit of that green that is just overwhelming. And then pops up this blue and it just like blows my world. And yeah, that's how I, I got to diving. And 
But from that snorkel trip, my mind was, you know, I, I felt a sense of belonging in this space. Um, there was an affirmation of what I've always believed in, that no one really needs to look like anything, like everything in the ocean looks so wildly different. And, you know, some people might use words like weird and scary and, but everything is different, but just coexists so beautifully. And I felt like it was the barrier that I battled with on land. Mm -hmm. There was a continuous request to, to assimilate whether into how women are or what the idea of the highest existence is. There's always this space that says, you're not good enough as you are. Why don't you look more like this? Or why don't you look more like that? And in the ocean lived this wild world of the craziest things you could ever imagine. And everybody just lived with each other. There was no requirement to be any less what you are. And I think that for me is how I ended up falling in love with the ocean because I didn't need to explain myself. I was just perfect as I was. Hmm. So after that experience, did you have it in your head? Like, you know what? I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to you know, start <laughs> doing this thing here. Like, or was it like a slow transition? It was a slow transition. So I used to be um, in corporate working in sales and marketing. But then in 2016, I started my own consultancy doing diversity and inclusion work, human resources, industrial relations. And it was incredible because, again, it was challenging the things that I, I, I find difficult in the world. And... After my snorkel trip, I come back into South Africa, learn to scuba dive. You know, I ask everyone, I'm like, what happens after snorkeling? Everyone says scuba diving. <laughs> and I get so deeply certified in scuba diving and it was incredible. But it didn't feel like that moment in 2016. Mm -hmm. And then I find free diving and there it is. There's that feeling of home. There's that feeling of, of purpose, of belonging. There it is. And that's when I knew that I wanted to become a free diving instructor. But from 2016, it was only in 2020 that I qualified as a freediving instructor. So it was a slightly slower transition. But lockdown gave me the courage to leave everything behind. As I qualified as a freediving instructor, the world closed up. Mm. Uh, we're, we're in lockdown and everything was changing. But inside of me was this tree that was, you know, blooming the question of, you know, we could really continue doing what we do, but I really want to be a mermaid. I really want to open up this ocean space. I really want to, I really want to tell anybody who would listen. And I, at that time, I was the most horrible person to be around. You couldn't <laughs> stop me talking about the ocean. It was horrible. Um, I think I've become better. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I know a lot of people, again, if we don't have connection to the water, we're like free diving. What, what exactly? Is. So what is free diving? Um, how would you explain that for people that don't know? Perfect example is if you think of scuba diving, scuba divers have tanks on their backs. Mm -hmm. And so when you're diving, you're breathing in and out the whole time. In free diving, that tank is your lungs. You don't have an external source of air. So you take a big breath in and you fill up your lungs and you begin to explore underwater on that one breath. <laughs> so sometimes you are exploring the reefs and you're seeing what's living between the kelp forests. Sometimes you're diving down to 30 meters or 100 feet or past 100 feet. Um, sometimes you're just, sometimes you're spear fishing. So you're looking for your dinner, you're going to catch a fish or two. It just depends on what you're doing, but it's the ability to explore underwater with just one breath. Mm. Now you're, you're super excited about that, which, which is great. But I'm thinking like free diving, like um, holding your breath in the ocean space. That's like, you don't know what's going to happen, what you're going to run into, what you're <laughs> going to see. Um, I know you could hold your breath for four minutes and all that. But it's like, what is the logic behind that as opposed to, you know, putting in an oxygen mask in and being able to do it like that as opposed to like holding your breath? Like, I, I, I just find that to be like just a just such a cautious activity, you know? <laughs> it's funny because, you know, scuba diving there's a place for scuba diving there's just time when you're like you know i just need to rest in the water but what makes free diving amazing is that other marine life gets closer to you mm. it allows you to be there you really have incredible interactions with marine life you're not loud with your scuba bubbles you're just you're on the same currency as the mammals in the ocean mm -hmm. um and i think that makes the encounter so much more special. Um, you see it with dolphins, you see it with whales, 
you see that the encounter is different. And what is probably the biggest thing about freediving is that you learn to manage yourself in discomfort. So you could be at 30 meters deep and you come across a massive bull shark. You don't have the option to break for the surface and you're just like running and you're freaking out. You don't have that option. You've got a finite amount of oxygen and you've got a rising level of carbon dioxide in your body. And so whatever you do needs to be measured. You don't have the option of uh, adrenaline, you know, run, but you pause and you are with the moment. What's Mm. happening? Okay, I'm a little bit afraid. Okay, focus. Um, And I think that for me has been the biggest learning because you don't have the option to scream because if you scream, you swallow the sea. If you panic, you're going to overuse the oxygen that's left in your body, swallow the sea. You know, and when I say swallow the sea, I literally mean drown because there's no, there's, there's no second option. Like there's no, uh-huh. uh, there's no fail safe mm. to, to your dive. And so you need to be so true to yourself and you need to be so truthful about your ability. However you dive, you need to be continuously aware of your own ability and your own ability to save yourself if anything has to go wrong. And, and so big accountability with self. But yeah, it's the most incredible thing just because really marine life gets really, really close to you. Right. And, and that's incredible. Absolutely. Um, I think there's still this fear with the whole shark thing. Um, in the United <laughs> States, um, there's a movie called Jaws. Uh, it's like an old school movie. I'm sure you might be aware of it. And <laughs> it's like one of the number one horror thriller movies out there. So there's wow. this deep fear about sharks and um, you know certain marine life in the water. Uh, what makes you and you know the girls that you swim with on the Discovery Channel okay with the fact that this animal or these animals that are you know kind of known to be like this scary thing and anything can happen at any given moment? What makes you feel secure and safe in that moment and not? panic pretty much um i think you know first things first is the narrative around sharks is incomplete Mm. you know jaws sold us a narrative that is incomplete but has lived as a trauma response in our body for forever and so sharks are not these man eating i can't (laughs) wait to eat that human no they, they they are not about that they have uh, bigger preferences for better things to eat. Um, But it is not to say that mistakes don't happen underwater. So for me, what gives us courage to be able to dive is recognizing that sharks aren't like human killing machines. Mm. Uh, And, but also it's just a complete, yeah, you just realize that you are encountering another being in the water and because they are wild, anything could happen, but it's the ability to manage yourself in the moment. And so I, I think that's continuously for me, the how I arrive in any ocean encounter with any marine set of marine life. Right. It's to manage yourself, even though great white sharks are scary. <laughs> Let me tell you, I've never been afraid underwater until I saw a great white shark coming in my direction. Mm. I was breathing in my throat, freaking out but i still had the camera on you know facing the shark and it's actually incredible to feel that that gush of of overwhelm and fear and then you still stay there's something about that Mm. (laughs) yeah that that is interesting i feel like once you conquer those type of fears life is just an easier process because you're like yo i've done the most fearful (laughs) thing already like uh you know there's still scary movies that that get (laughs) put out about sharks and things like that that uh you know that people buy into and things like that so i feel like conquering some of those things it makes life a little bit easier to handle do you think that's the case 100 percent. the biggest learning in free diving is probably what has liberated me on land today the world of adrenaline equals run is never a good is is never like there are moments maybe when you come across a bear but the ability to pause and be with yourself Mm-hmm. when you're afraid when you're angry um i feel like that's such a powerful powerful learning so it's the presence enough to be truthful with yourself right and to pause and observe what is happening and then move um there's such power in that mm-hmm. that is how i live my life whether i'm about to speak 
somewhere and I'm afraid, I pause and I hold that fear and I step into it and I touch it. And then the moment changes. There's power in the touching of that fear. Um, to be truthful, I'm afraid and it's okay. And then you move from there. I really think um, that's changed my life. That is powerful, man. That is powerful. Uh, another component of what you do is um, ocean activism. So you're an activist for the ocean spaces. And uh, looking into South Africa, are there a unique set of issues that exist in the ocean spaces in South Africa? And, um, you know, what are those things? I would say, so I'm an advocate for diverse representation in ocean spaces. And all that means is that in South Africa, the ocean is largely undiverse. So many black people say to me, why do you do white people things? Mm. The ocean is to be a white people space. And I say, that's not true. Right. But where we find ourselves is not by mistake. It is by design. So when you look at apartheid, where we come from, people were removed from their ocean facing homes, placed in more dangerous um not even more dangerous, but less desirable spaces that are close to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that changes the culture of how people engage with the ocean. And, you know, again, lack of access to swimming lessons. And there's so much there, the inaccess to the basic levels of, of ocean exploration really changes how people approach the ocean. And so for me, my work is to say the ocean is not a white people's space. It's a everybody's space. Come see. Hmm. recognizing that there is a fear that often lives in in black and brown communities particularly when it comes to the ocean and so my work is to just to bridge that gap to to hopefully find a world where we're able to move past that fear enough to be curious and in this curiosity find connection right. and in the connection find home and in finding home choose to protect the ocean because she is such a massive life giver and the narrative, you know, we need to, we need all hands on deck if we're going to protect these oceans. We need all hands on deck if the inheritance that we leave for the generations to come is going to be anything of value. And the generations to come deserve that, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's just the question. What are we going to leave behind? Who do we want to be? How are we going to tell our story? But also how are we going to expand all the worlds that we thought we knew? to charter new territories. Mm. That is uh, definitely interesting. And I think that that's amazing work that you're doing. Um, also to looking into, I guess, the United States. So there's issues that exist like in the ocean in the United States, like um, the uh, killing of marine life at, from fishing, you know, unintended killing of marine life from fishing that results in near extinction of certain species. Um, the pollution in the water, um, yeah. just a uh, just a number of issues that exist um, amongst the oceans in the United States. Do you find these to be like the same issues that exist in South Africa, or do you guys have a unique set of issues that you're dealing with? I would say from our side, we definitely do have a problem with bycatch. So when you look at certain species like whale sharks, we used to get whale sharks a lot. We mm -hmm. don't. And no one is able to tell why that is, except for the fact that we've got uh, trolling trolling um, vessels, so large fishing vessels that you can't you can't say it's them, but we've got these large vessels that are, you know, harvesting fish in the night. But the whale sharks are gone. Where have they gone? So for us, it is definitely overfishing. It is definitely pollution, plastic pollution. We're finding lots of plastic in the water. And we're finding fishing line, which, you know, marine life finds itself entangled in this fishing line. And I think if, you know, something that I've started to see is the bleaching of our corals in one of our most pristine diving, um, diving spaces, which is in Sudwana Bay. And I always say, once you see even a coin sized piece of um, coral that is bleached, you know that we have a problem because once you can see it, it, it exponentially changes from there. How does it get bleached? It's bleached because of the warming temperatures, ah. so climate change. Okay. And it's quite interesting because you might say, you know, in the States, it is this, and I always say our oceans are connected. We're all, ha we're all facing the same global challenges. When we look at climate change, that degree and a half to two degree change is causing 
if you know whether it's in the in Antarctica where the ice is melting quicker, that affects everybody. You know, here in in Cape Town, when the temperature changes too quickly in the water, a whole lot of fish die out. And all that means is that they were not able to move fast enough to get to safety to warmer waters in time. Mm. And that just tells you that the more we have erratic temperatures, the more change we're going to see. And the most vulnerable communities are going to suffer the, the largest effect of climate change and everything else that comes as a result of unhealthy oceans. Mm. Now, sometimes when we, we think about some of these issues, we, we might think it's massive, it's beyond our reach, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Is there anything like the individual average person can do about some of these things? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I love to say when we start to do something, we enable those around us to actually see that there could be a, a point for change as well. So single-use plastic, say no to single-use plastic all the time. Have a reusable bottle, water bottle. Have a reusable coffee cup. Have a reusable um, cutlery. Have a reusable uh, grocery bag. All that means is the less demand there is for plastic, the less plastic will be made. Mm -hmm. right? Just because it's really hard to, um, what's that word? Plastic takes a very long time to, to, to disintegrate. Um, it lives for thousands of years. So right. we, need to get, we need to move away from that one. Two, we need to look at how we travel. So if you can travel together, travel with other people because our carbon emissions are getting higher and higher. But three, hold business accountable. As individuals, we're able to make individual change, which makes change in the greater but business remains the largest contributors to carbon emissions, to the plastic that ends up in the world, to the oil that spills in the ocean. We need to hold business accountable because we're saying everything that we allow business to do that mm. harms our natural spaces takes away from the inheritance of the generations to come. Mm. Like we, we're either going to leave a burning planet for our children's children. And what does that look like? And so in every single moment, the question says, when we hear of a gas spill, what are we doing with that? You know, an oil spill, what are we doing with that? It's important that we use our money to create change and hold business accountable because it cannot be a continuous thing that we say, oh, well, you know, we think that it's far away from us, but it's closer than we think. Mm. Yeah, appreciate that. Appreciate that. There's things that we can do. Um, so. Another thing that you are doing um, activism wise is through the Black Mermaid Foundation. So can you share about that with us, why it exists and what your mission is with that? The Black Mermaid Foundation is the first thing that I started doing, right? As I became a freediving instructor, I knew I wanted to create diverse representation in ocean spaces. I wanted to see it in careers. I wanted to see it in sport and I wanted to see it recreationally. And so I started this foundation working with little kids between 10 and 15 years old, taking them out into the ocean to go snorkeling. Mm -hmm. With most of the kids, it's their first time seeing beneath the surface of the water. And so there's also in the space very big fear and and that fear is too right it comes from the fear of the physical ocean but it comes from the fear of the stories that we grow up with about what lives in the ocean it's a big snake that takes people it's an ancestral space there's so many stories that we grow up with mm -hmm. and so with most of the kids there's all of that big fear, but somewhere along the way, you know, they decide to trust me and they come out. And it's always so incredible when you see the fear turn into curiosity and into that curiosity, it's just a new world and the kids begin to play. So that is our work, take kids out snorkeling. And the whole idea says, what would happen if the kids saw what lives in the water? Mm. What would it mean for the ocean space to not feel foreign? What would it mean for the ocean to look like them too? What would it mean if when they are choosing their subjects as to what they'll be, maybe marine biology won't be daunting. Maybe it would be a world that they could see themselves living in. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is what would happen if we changed narratives around the ocean? And, you know, as they grow up and become future leaders, business leaders, ordinary citizens, health presidents, maybe in every decision that they make, they would say, hey, I know a place 
that really could do with my voice. And, and I think that's, that's my work to capacitate these humans to really take charge and ownership of the ocean and hopefully become stakeholders when we say, you know, this is going to happen with the oceans. They would use their voices as, as equal stakeholders to, to her health and her protection. Yeah, that is so powerful, man. Um, so let's just say like one of these kids goes in um, on one of your excursions and they are amazed and fascinated. Like, oh, my God, this work is amazing. I love what Zandi's doing. Um, I want to become that, that, that. What are some of their options outside of uh, marine biology to become that, that, that? I, 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 lo- I love this. So there's, of course, marine biology. You can be an oceanographer. So you're learning about the tides, how the tides move and how that changes which marine life is living where you can be a um free diving instructor or scuba diving instructor teaching the world to dive traveling the world which is always incredible you can be an underwater welder many people don't think of that like as um so welding is normally i don't know if any yeah but welding but underwater so if you think of those big big ships sometimes Mm -hmm. Be repaired out at sea and so that's actually also a very well-paying job <laughs> mm-hmm. you can be uh, a cinematographer an underwater cinematographer so when you're watching discovery channel and you see this massive shark come towards the camera there's usually someone in the water that's holding that camera and so you can be that person exploring and becoming a filmmaker of course yeah i've already said you could become a guide I often think about, you know, when we think of what we're going to be, we always think the highest amount of money that you could earn. Mm. But like, I know so many skippers who live the most moderate life, but their joy is, and and so again, I hope that we would find worlds where we're led by the heart um, and it's less attached to the bigger of, you know, I could have the biggest house. Sometimes you live the most simple life and, you're happy in ways that you could never imagine. Mm. And so as a skipper, you're chartering these waters. You know these waters better than anybody else. And when you stop because you see dolphins coming, you're able to read the dolphin behavior. And it's really just such an incredible world as well. You might not live in the water, but you make that access to ocean spaces and that access to marine life so sacred, just off your knowledge. Man, that is amazing. I, I didn't know myself that there were so many different avenues um, in the ocean for us. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so looking into your work, man, you're doing the activism, you're doing the Black Mermaid Foundation, you're doing the um, the instruction, um, the free diving instruction, and just outside of uh, outside of that, you're doing other stuff. So where do you find time? Like, what does your nine to five generally look like to do all these things? Oh, all right. So... I wish I had a solid nine to five. Um, (laughs) I feel like I have a 24 on 24 on 24 on 24. Um, I've, I think for me, it was just realizing that I'm only one person. And so what does it mean to allocate space as, and when I can. So in addition to everything else, I've moved into film. So I'm telling stories. Uh, My first film that where I'm a director on has just gone live on a global platform on Mm. Waterbay, which is really incredible because these stories need to be told. And it's incredible to be an African telling African stories to the world, uh, changing and reweaving narratives for for the generations to come. Uh, I do speaking work as well. And so the question for me now has become, what can I do that enables me to do more for the foundation? And so it just means that if I speak and I film and I this and I that, then I'm able to take out X amount of excursions because my foundation is still very largely self-funded. And so I take the kids on my own cost. But for me, it's just learned to, I've learned to be present with myself, recognize what is possible, pause what I can't do so that you're able to show up in your fullness everywhere. Mm. Um, Because you know, a full cup means that other people can drink from it, but scarcity doesn't breed. It doesn't make more. It doesn't make um, abundance. So every so often I'll pause the world. I can't do this. I can't do that. And then I show up again and I'm like, the cup's full again. And everybody's <laughs> drinking and we're all partying. And yeah, just kind of learning to to measure self and be true with self. Mm. 
Yeah, that's yeah, amazing, man. Amazing. Um, kudos to you for the work that you're doing. Um, wanted to get into a quick little activity here before we wrap up. It's called What's Your Favorite? Identifying a few of your favorite things. So you could be short and brief if you want, or you can expand. Um, so what has been your ex- favorite experience in the water? Uh, free diving to the sound of whales, going down to depth with the sound of whales, humpback whales. Mm. Um, favorite thing about the ocean? She's incredibly vast um, and she's an alive body, alive with endless possibilities. Mm. Um, favorite animal that you've seen in the water? Uh, I absolutely love dolphins, but I adore round ribbon tail stingrays. They are, they look like these alien discs with these weirdish eyes. I, I'm obsessed with how they swim and just, I'm obsessed with round ribbon tail rays. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite event that you've been a part of connected to the ocean? Easily Discovery Shark Week. Um, looking for great white sharks and seeing my first ever great white shark on land when they breached and underwater easily. Mm. Okay. Favorite experience or teaching moment that you've had with your children at the foundation? Having one of the kids be, she was afraid and she wouldn't hold on to the boy and she held my hand and I said, you know, the boy is safe. And she said, no, please let me hold your hand. And she holds my hand and we, I say to her, let's count to three and we both look underwater and she was really afraid. So I say one, two, three, and we both look under and we look back at each other and I smile and she giggles and we, I say again, we count to three, but we hold for three and I count to three and we hold for three and she looks back up at me and she says, it's a starfish. I started crying. That is, you know, she trusted just long enough to be able to see something under there. Mm. I know you've mentioned um, having a deep connection with your grandmother. So um, what's your favorite lesson that you got from your grandmother? Sure, there's so much to just be aware what legacy I want to leave, what to be aware of the gift it is to live in and with the ocean and and the question of what am I going to do with the gift that has been gifted to me. Mm, Powerful, powerful. Um, What's been your favorite life gem uh, that anybody has given you? So life lesson or life words of wisdom or whatever it is that um, you uh, kind of hold on to. Can I, can I count the ocean as her gift? Like the words of wisdom, because it is actually from the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just be truthful. The, the, the connection currency is truth. Um, mm. Show up in your truth always. Mm. Powerful, powerful. All right, you just mentioned your your grandmother kind of really had the idea and the thought of legacy into your head and what you're doing. So when we are speaking about legacy and what you want to be remembered as um, in 30, 40, 50 years from now, when the movie about your life comes out, um, what is it that you want people to remember and to understand about you and the work that you did? I want to be remembered as a person that liberated the human existence to to not be bounded by anything, that anything is possible. Um, But I also, of course, want to be known as one of the key voices that were present when we spoke about about diversifying the ocean space and just expanding the worlds that we come from, particularly as Black people. And, you know, the the person who advocated for the normative to be more than one, Mm -hmm. for the normative to not only be white, but to look like actually all of us and the celebration of black bodies in the ocean space in, in its entirety, our hair, our bodies, our, our culture, to not assimilate, to show up in your truth and, and, and be that unapologetically. I really want to be the black woman that showed up and just glorified the fullness of the black existence while ensuring that assimilation is not the only way in which black bodies can exist in ocean spaces. Hmm. Man, powerful, powerful. Um, (laughs) uh, So, man, it's been a wonderful experience chatting with you. I feel so inspired. Um, Maybe one day I'll go on my own ocean excursion, even though I got that I got that fear myself, you know, that I got to conquer with the ocean um, and the water and everything. But um, knowing that people like you exist and 
that you were also once afraid and conquering that um, means a lot. I think to people, black people all over that are fearful about these spaces and think that, well, this space is not for me and um, I'm not supposed to be here. So seeing you is just, I think, just revolutionary and um, kudos to the work that you're doing. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. And everything you said, we all start somewhere. And anytime when you're afraid and you're uncertain, just remember that you're standing on holy ground. Mm, appreciate that. Uh, before we leave out, um, do you mind leaving us with your favorite quote and what it means to you? My favorite quote is that we are land-based ocean creatures. So we are land-based ocean creatures. And for me, it's just a reminder that all of us come from the ocean. And when we ex explore the ocean, we just realize that this is a home for all of us. Um, in every single moment when that fear leaves, you realize how connected you are to the ocean. So we might be based on land, but we are 100% ocean creatures. Mm. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I, I would love to have you back on at some point because I know you're going to be doing amazing things and more work around the ocean and maybe even a book, you know, at some point. Um, <laughs> some wonderful things <laughs> going on. So we'll definitely have you back um, on the program. Thank you for coming through. Uh, listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, definitely share the program. I think, you know, knowing that people like Zandi exist um, for our young people, our young black kids is extremely important so that they can think about some of these new ventures in the ocean and, you know, what they can do to add value in the world. Um, so thank you for giving us that, Zandi. I appreciate it. Um, and we will be looking into your future work and everything you're doing. Um, so again, listeners, thank you for listening. And remember, your mind is the most powerful tool in the universe. Therefore, if you can think it, you can do it. If you believe in it, you can be it. And if you fight for it, you can have it. The world is yours. This has been your host, Mr. G, and I'll see you next time on Mastermind.